Welcome to Arkham Postcast, where we discuss productivity, self-hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co-host, Jack Moore. How are you doing today, Jack? I'm doing well. I'll tell you what, I updated Jitsi over here. Uh, it sounds like you updated it over there, and it is just a bit different view for me today. So uh, I'm doing well. Everything's just kind of different. How are you doing over there? Yeah, I'm uh, I'm pretty good. Uh, I, I think this is actually going to be pretty cool because now I can uh, more granularly manage how large we are. Um, and me being the uh, the narcissist I am, uh, I've, I've made us uh, really large. So that's going to be fun to see the difference in the videos. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I, I had recently updated to see as well too. Uh, and, and here's a pro tip uh, to everyone who's, who's running a, a Linux distro as a desktop. Um, don't sudo pip install anything uh, lest your system-wide package manager uh, get upset with you and refuse to update. Oh, that does not sound great. <laughs> I've even isn't I there mean, a warning? Isn't there a warning there that is, says explicitly is, yes. do not run pip as sudo? <laughs> That's super easy. That's rude. There is. Now I'm lucky Man. to be running an arch based distro where a lot of those packages are available. Though they're they're packaged uh, by various maintainers. But if you wanna run something like Red Hat or Ubuntu maybe, and you're trying to be bleeding edge, right? You're not going to be able to install that with the system package manager. So you're going to have to be more intelligent about the way that you set up some of your, your processes, especially if you're using it as a server. And you're like, oh, I need this dependency, right? That's when you start using virtual environments and stuff. And I actually followed the rabbit trail down because Manjaro is very good at, at giving a um, place for people to... Uh, show what happened uh, on a specific update. So they have a thread um, all about issues that people have ran into and like a summary even at the top. And uh, the response to the issue I was having was uh, RTFM, which was the Arch Wiki. And sure enough, it just said, remove all the, the files and try again. And, and that worked. So how about that? <laughs> but, I, I mean, it's, it's weird. It's weird because I've been in this game a while. You know, I've been I've been running Linux on the desktop since 2014, 2015, maybe, and I've just gotten used to these type of things. Now I've gotten burned before, don't get me wrong, but I've I've learned my lesson and and have an idea of oh okay, someone tells me to remove you know all of the packages inside of a directory of user lib, right? I probably shouldn't just remove them. I should probably move them somewhere else. Um, check first or what does it verify but yeah 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 uh, trust but, but verify, verify. Yeah. yeah trust but verify yeah so you know move moving them over and then and then really understanding what that do that's doing because like if i move over the wrong libraries then my python based package manager won't work so i have to make sure that you know the ones i'm moving over aren't the ones that it needs to function Hey, don't straight delete these. We might need them. Exactly. Now, in, in all else goes wrong, I'll still have, you know, rsync and, and the move command. I can put them back. Uh, so it, it's just it's just little things like that where I think, you know, if I don't have, if I hadn't had the experience that I, I have, I wouldn't have necessarily known what to do in that scenario. And and that's that's just something I think is really cool being in the job that I'm in, being exposed to this so much. Uh, that something like that for me is second nature. And I know it's not for everyone. And I know people will, will, will look down at, at those kind of issues and say, well, there's no, there's no default way to fix stuff like that. And I'm like, well, no, there's not, because you have to be wise about it. You have to you, you have a modicum of intelligence on, uh, as to how you deal with it. And what do you mean? I can't just upgrade <laughs> without <laughs> checking dependencies. <laughs> well, and I'm even worse too. I don't. I don't even read release notes. I need to get in that habit, you know. But just send it off. Just, just like, yep, looks great. Just <laughs> let's uh, let's yolo ourselves yo into a in, into an update. So, man, always always something to do better, I guess. But that's a tangent that I didn't think I was going to get into today. Uh, because we do have plenty of articles, uh, actually, Jack, that you had uh, selected quite a few for us. So if you want to, to start telling the uh, the story of burnout and whoa. Sure, I would love to. Honestly, 
uh, the one th- this article this first article uh it's titled the burden of an open source maintainer i didn't really like the title because i don't think it's burnout i think it's just kind of overload uh on this one guy jeff gearing here he wrote this article put it out uh came out pretty recently fine january and he's just writing about basically how he maintains a plethora of projects he says he maintains over 200 projects he's a top contributor <laughs> and he gets 50 to 100 emails a day basically saying hey can you merge my pr in or can you look at my pr and the one thing that struck out to me on this entire article article uh it was kind of upsetting to see you get these maintainers uh, out there and you see this guy he's working 200 projects right that, that's a lot to deal with i think between you and me we have 10 uh, you know breaking that down that's still a decent amount if you think about drive-by c- contributions and people just pushing up saying hey look this fix this is something that fixed my issue and it's you know something in depth something that's not code something that's or something that is code something that's not just oh it's an update for the readme i updated a spelling you know you spelled something wrong something that actually requires kind of an in-depth look at it's unfortunate to see PRs go stale, uh, merger quests that just are left to go stale, and issues that you know if people aren't following up, they the guy this Jeff says he just lets the stale bot take care of it, and it's like well look the issue could still exist, but just because I didn't write that it's you know comment hey this is I'm still encountering this, it doesn't mean it's not there anymore. They just don't go away, so a little bit unfortunate to see. I wish there was just a little bit more contribution i think is what i would lo- what i would like so uh i just want to get more involved i think with kind of maintaining the projects and doing doing better and so i've started to look into rails more and core ruby uh that's one of my goals for this year on um seeing what i can do to actually contribute and not just use the project report the issues and go about my way it's it's certainly hard to come to a balance of contributing to open source and consuming open source because you 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 don't want to keep pushing stuff for example on jeff right you you right. want what you're doing to be meaningful valuable right right and for if, everybody if you just do something there's a chance that that something isn't valuable so so making sure that that something is valuable takes a whole nother level of sophistication and, and, and thought put into what you're doing, um, which which hopefully doesn't distract you from the thing you're trying to do in the first place, which is use it, right? And it's frustrating. I, I get it for a lot of these, these tooling, so like languages specifically, because you're using those languages to do other things which also right. take up your time um, yet the core language development itself uh, takes up time it you know for other people um, so he Jeff here has several different ways to to mitigate that one just ruthlessly kind of closing PRs uh, when they're when they're not needed um, and and uh, keeping what was it? What was the second thing? The stale bot, basically yeah. keeping issues. If, yeah. if issues aren't commented on within a certain time period, they're basically automatically closed out. Which is another unfortunate one, just because an issue was reported and it's not commented on doesn't mean it just magically goes away. Now, the one thing I'll say that he did comment at the very beginning. I don't know if you saw it. Is the fact that the way I think, and now this is very specific to him, uh, not all open source projects, but he says he makes it very, I think he said pluggable. I'm going to have to find it in here, but he says he makes uh, his project, the projects basically as open as possible and as as pluggable. Like if you can basically just plug in mm-hmm. as, as easy as possible. So Pretty, pretty agnostic, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so that's a good strategy is what... I kind of took away from that. And it's it's weird because the, the first thing that you would think is, all right, well, build out some kind of a community around something or, or, or a support model where you have people that, you know, you're not the only one to to work on this. But, you know, you look at you look at Linus and, and really it's the same thing. I mean, the buck stops with the maintainer. 
right? So it doesn't matter how many people you have working with you, right? You, you can still put yourself in that position of, of burnout if you don't take the appropriate measures. Um, and and even on your, your second model, I mean, that is a team of people who are trying to right. avoid burnout, right? So, so the second article here uh, is talking about why uh, Bolt.com uh, switched to a four-day work week, right? Why, why they're going through that, what they, they hope to, to fix and, and kind of rethink um, working in 2022. Yeah, that one was pretty interesting. I, I told you before the show or during the pre-show here, the most interesting quote I took away from the entire article was, uh, here's what many of us know but can be tough to admit, which is a terribly written sentence uh, or terribly written half sentence. But basically it's, work will fill the space you give it to. So basically they said, look, we're going to do Monday through Thursday and you take, if you don't have, it sounded like they're going to four day week, but if you have to come in on Friday to do stuff, you have, you, you know, you're coming in on Friday to do that. But honestly, if you say, all right, look, I'm not coming in. I don't want to come in on Friday. Then you're going to try and get all of your work done Monday through Thursday. So you can have the, the whole day free. So that's kind of what I took away from it. I know you also mentioned before, uh, during the pre-show, the, conscious.org if you want to go into that one well, uh, they've touch got on that of, a little bit they've got a lot of resources there i i haven't gotten the ability to dive in but it looks like like a lot of what we've been talking about you know how to be a, a mindful leader um, how to work efficiently they even have something in there about inbox zero but that's not what i wanted to focus on here i wanted to focus on you know they're they're trying this new thing to prevent burnout right as as a team which is which is different from from preventing burnout as an individual because you don't have necessarily have a a person where the buck stops especially with a with a small internal team like this the the thing i'm wondering is what do you think about making it a three-day weekend right rather than having a four-day work week specifically calling out that the weekend is three days in a row. The days off are are three days in a row and the days on are four days in a row. What do I specifically think of that? If you have an opinion. I mean, I don't, I hadn't, I I don't have a comment or an opinion on that. I mean, so there was there. Yeah. Go ahead. I, and, and, and I may, right. I'm not sure that I have a, a good one, but, but I have certainly looked into this before, you know, and, and, what they call out here is right. I mean, they they are adopting this approach because they believe that it will, you know, cut uh, unnecessary communications. That they're going to trim out excess meetings. Um, they'll get more concrete work done during the time that they do have, uh, which are touted as uh, advantages to to this kind of system. However, it's it's not true flexibility, and as we know one of the things that motivates people is autonomy, right? And part of autonomy is the ability to be flexible. And as we've seen, a lot of people uh, enjoy the work from home ethic because they can log in when they need to. They can, uh, you know, come back and and do things when it's kind of quieter for them rather than uh, I have to stay at work until a set time and then rush home to get little Jimmy to soccer practice and then go to little Susie's dance recital and then come home and then I can't do anything until the next morning, right? That, that's that's not been what's been going on the past two years. The past two years, it's kind of been a state of, of flux where people are able to get what they need to done when they have the ability to do so, or at least in most of the technical spaces here. Um, one of the things I heard from CGP Gray uh, is that he likes to have like a weekend Wednesday Right. And then take like a Saturday or Sunday off, whatever is kind of more advantageous for him. Right. So he's still taking two days off and having five days on. But but he's mixing it up. He said he's he's really found uh, it, it, it comfortable for him to have a break in the middle of the week to just stop with the work stuff and do the do the home stuff that he's been putting off yeah. at. Um, and then 
you know, if if Saturday is the day he needs to go running around or, or Sunday or, or even both, right? He has the flexibility to do that. Now, that's a little bit different because he is kind of working for himself. He has that flexibility where he is beholden to him and a small team of people who are just working to, to get their, their, their stuff done. The, the downside with that in a more structured environment like this, and, and, and I'm just bringing this up because I'm pinging off both sides of the fence here, the, the availability, and, and they actually do mention this at, at conscious.org, but the ability to be available when people need you, right, to, to not have that 100% capacity, if you're doing that, that floating type of work where you're just going in working when you need to work, uh, you're going to have 100% of the time that you sit down to work taken up, right? You're not going to have any free capacity. You're not going to have any free cycles. You're not going to have any downtime that you can spend with other people or to be available for other people. Uh, you know, as, as, as well, and, and this has been a problem for distributed teams for a while, you know, how, how do you communicate in an expedient type of manner when people are on at different times of the day, right? right. It's, it's very helpful for when you are all at the office at the same time, or even just all logged into the VPN at the same time to know that you can ping someone during normal business hours and, and they're, they're kind of expected to be available. Exactly. Right. Right. So there are, there are, there are ways that th I, I think this will help uh, the, the mentality of the team to, to, to be more productive, to be able to have, you know, more relaxing, fulfilling weekends uh, and, and, and to have that get that personal time back. Uh, and and I also believe that there are alternatives to this. Right. And, and just kind of laying out one that that that, for instance, you could take a Wednesday off and, and have a floating day to work, you know, doing something like that. Uh, could also work in other scenarios. So I'm not saying that this is the end all be all for four day work week, but I think it is a very interesting experiment. And, and that's what they call it here. They call it an experiment. Uh, they're, they're testing the hypothesis and, and doing so, they say, with an organization that has big goals, a growing team and a lot on the line. Uh, so I'm I'm very excited that they chose to do this. And, and I look forward to seeing more companies take this approach in the future. I'm interested to see that as well. I'm inter just interested to see as, as this company grows or doesn't, for that matter, as is it, it is a startup, to see if they end up going from a four-day work week to a more traditional, or I say traditional, if they end up switching back saying, hey, look, we thought we were going to see a lot better results. We actually didn't. So definitely would like to see you, you always hear about the success right you never hear no one really ever hears about the failure for everything so i don't know if you know it's hard to post a failure like hey we went to four day weeks and guess what no one was available on friday and we had some developer push something out on a friday or whatever well, but yeah or, it'll be interesting to see or use that for for another purpose so i'm gonna i'm gonna launch into our next article that is is seemingly uh a a a big difference from what we've been talking about but i promise i'm going to bring it back because uh, the 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 last one we have here is that last pass uh, confirms that there was a credential stuffing attack uh, against some of its users right. so the uh, credential stuffing attacks uh, they say here in the article from the record.media so i mean yeah it's a source, but they, they have a good explanation here. They say credential stuffing attacks have been a pretty common occurrence. Uh, these type of attacks uh, are aimed at, at big online services, right? Wherein they, uh, they have uh, a, a database of passwords that has been uh, leaked somehow. Uh, usually it's been like uh, a, 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 uh, disconnected, not disconnected, but like a, a, a different services uh, service got hacked or its or its credentials got hacked, right? And and those have been reverse engineered, right? We talk about when you have the hash of, of someone's password, even if you hash it, you can rainbow attack it. And then someone who has a uh, fairly uh, insecure password is, is going to have that broken, right? Um, so what, what happened with LastPass is that someone, someone found these and then subsequently tried to log into 
LastPass with some of these credentials. The problem is that some of that worked. So what, what, what does that tell us, right? So if these attackers have gotten credentials, so username and passwords from some other data breach, and they're now trying those same credentials against LastPass, it means that the, the people using this LastPass service were using the same password to log into this other service that got hacked. Which is the wrong thing to do, like, to be honest. <laughs> if you have a password manager, why, in fact, are you using the same password for your password manager as all your other services? Exactly. Exactly. Like, that's that's a big question. And there are plenty of ways that people could have could have gotten there, right? But the, the problem I've seen with, with a lot of these attacks against, let's, let's call them normies or you know just just things that you wouldn't think about is that it's really easy you know if i've already had a password forever for all my other services and i sign up for this password manager service let me just use the password that i've been using for all of my other services with this one and going forward sure i can I can Update do them. the necessary sure. thing i can i can create new passwords for all my new services but It'd be, you know, a minor inconvenience to go back and change my old services to use a new generated password, right? What, what's the average user have? 270 passwords? It's going to be a massive inconvenience. That's two days of straight signing into services and changing it, basically. Exactly. But, yeah. And, and that's, that's not, you know, the only type of way to, you know, quote unquote, secure yourself online, right? There's, there's tons of little things here and there that... You know, it's it's almost like brushing your teeth before you go to bed. I mean, you, you just kind of got to do it over and over. Or you know, in this password thing, password managers, you have to you have to take that approach and actually migrate passwords over to to better, more secure passwords, right? But having the mental capacity to deal with that necessarily means that you have to not be burnt out, right? You have to have the bandwidth to protect yourself online. And protecting yourself online is the same as protecting yourself in the real world. It takes effort. You can't expect to expend all your effort during the work week or on maintaining open source projects and then be able to come back and have a secure web presence. I mean, that's just not going to happen, right? Right. So as as much as it seems like we really nitpick on, you know, um, open source maintainers or, or, or companies you know, making the most and, and, and being as flexible as, as they possibly can, right? The reason we're doing this is because it benefits us all by having them not get hacked, right? And as well as, you know, many, many other advantages, but at least, you know, they're able to to step back, you know, and, and if you're able to get that personal time, I'd actually probably prioritize that, right? And then maybe that extra time you have from that, you know, one day a week that you gain by transitioning to a four day work week, you can now spend mentally going over, all right, how my finances, right? How is my security online? Right. You know, did I just stuff, normal human stuff that people forget that creeps up on you. You're right. able to to have the mental capacity to deal with that, which, which you aren't if you're overworked, if you're overstressed, if you're burnt out. Um, so I guess balance is, is the main the main thrust of this this uh, this intro this this uh, this part of the show. I was gonna say you really roped it all back together. I like that. Um, we can jump into. We have some news and community updates. Nothing compared to the intro. That's why I kind of added a bunch of articles for the intro. Yeah. We have two dollar bar updates and one Firefly three update. Honestly, all three were just minor. Uh, and then I didn't see anything else across the services. With Dollbar, they entered into their 14.0 maintenance release. And so, then I see here Firefly 5.6.10. So just keep it on top yep. of those. So that's good. And then those two are out there. And then I did include there's a second one uh, for Dollbar, which was the 2021 retrospective. And I know that you love your infographics. Mm. So they put one together that I thought was pretty good. Ooh. They have this nice infographic basically on uh lines of code contributed uh their growth on socials you know how many apps i think or add-ons were added and look then at this, downloads though. look at this though external modules available on the dollar store 
right? Which is kind of like their app store. Yeah. They had 902 editions, right? That's a that's, lot. That's a lot. But that is only a 19% bump. So. <laughs> There's, I did not appreciate the magnitude of external modules that were available if 900 of them only bumped it less than 20%. 20%. <laughs> What does that mean? There are five thousand already out there. I math, but that that's a lot more than I thought. But yeah, I thought that one was pretty interesting, just because you don't see. I mean, how often do you see uh, kind of like retro like this? A uh, I forget what they called it. Yeah, retrospective of twenty twenty one. Main indicators of the year. They're at least tracking it. They have it. So very cool. Good to see. And we uh, don't have but, a retro, but we do have developments. Uh, that we accomplished yeah. in the the intervening two weeks between our last episode and, and this one. Uh, so we have, let's see, two instance features that I noted down here. Uh, one of them was the ability to migrate data from local to remote storage. Uh, this is like step one of seven in our plans of adding external volumes uh, onto... Uh, instances so that we can expand storage uh, pretty much infinitely uh, so that whatever you need to have available up there however much you need to have available up there is able to be made available specifically this is going to come in handy for next cloud uh, you know uploading videos uh, pictures what have you um, now as a to take a step back and to put on like a, a consultant type hat uh, one of the, the interesting case studies I've seen is the way that Jupiter Broadcasting put together their instance because they are obviously very tech savvy people. You know, they run several Linux podcasts and, you know, have for at least a decade, if not two, if not more. And their approach that they've taken is to use a cloud instance of Nextcloud, uh, you know, on, I think they maintain it on Linode to use that as their uh, hot swap Nextcloud instance, like where they keep the last three months worth of, of information there, uh, and then subsequently archiving that. And they have a they have multiple local servers, you know, that, that they can use and, and use as storage. But that setup uh, is cost effective. Uh, because that accessibility in the cloud really only gets you an ROI when you're using it, right? Um, if you need to dig it up, you certainly want to have it available, but the likelihood that you're going to need to to grab that, you know, versions and versions of versions past when it was actually relevant is, is certainly diminishing. Um, so the the ability to archive that and, and just keep what's necessary in the cloud is going to maximize uh, the the cost savings um, that right. that right. will bring you while still maintaining a uh, access to those files. Uh, but who knows what three months looks for for an individual? It could be you know ten gigs, could be a hundred gigs, could be five hundred gigs. Who knows? Uh, but we're taking steps towards being able to handle that. Um, and I ran into a really interesting thing that Jack and I went over in Ansible where in include role was trying to evaluate a grandparent's role via dependency. So like a dependency of a dependency had an include role in it. And the, the very first uh, role that, that started that dependency chain had a conditional. Well, of course, the variable that that conditional is being called isn't going to be available in the, the very last include role statement right. but but it was trying to evaluate it just because of the internals of what ansible pulls forward so uh we had to work around that uh so that was interesting you'll 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 see that in the the pr that was raised for that specific one uh just just an you know another one of those idiosyncrasies and you're going to find it in any language right and that's just something you get used to as you you know work day in day out in in any type of language but uh it was just an interesting one to me. I actually have already talked it uh, about it ad nauseum, so I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna leave it at that. But it was it was interesting to to walk through that and and uh, to be able to strip everything away and and produce a a, a minimum kind of reproducer uh, set of uh, playbooks Error. and roles. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
uh, to be so it, it it took up a lot of my time but i was i was happy that now i have an even better understanding and might i add a documented in the code understanding of how this works and why this has to be as it is um and then jack also was able to uh, to work on some of the application views or at least the yeah, status I- one as we've mentioned, I think over the past couple episodes, just getting the application views all together here. I think last week was logs. This I should say last episode was logs. This episode is the status of it. And now the interesting thing we have now with Portal for the application views is that now instead of seeing one status that says healthy for all the apps, when in fact one could be unhealthy, you're going to see specific individualized statuses for these services. And then you know, if one's unhealthy, it's only going to run a fix on itself. It's not going to run it against the entire instance. So exciting to see that. Uh, just one more small thing as we work towards 4041 here yeah. um, for Portal. The environment, and, get ready for that one. Yeah, that, and that's it, coming up next year. Yeah, and a, and a couple fixes to that resiliency, you know, as we march forward to 4.1, right? Yeah. Um, Talking about defense in depth, uh, right? This this wasn't necessarily a, a huge issue, but there was uh, a, a password that we kept on the droplet that we really didn't need to, right? Uh, it was really only used when we ran the specific backup command that we needed to. So that being the case, why not just remove it when it's it's unneeded? So you know, if an instance does have something happen to it that's not just sitting there so um i was i was happy to get that implemented just as a little bit of technical data it should have been that way the entire time but wasn't uh the other couple things are adding a single volume within without inputting the droplet id right uh and 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 the block volume maintenance so these were uh more things towards that ability to to scale um, and at the end of the day, what we ended up with is is a declarative way uh, to set the size uh, of the remote storage on an instance. So if you need an extra 10 gigs of hex or 500 gigs, whatever, right? There's no math that anyone has to do. Uh, the, the code will just say what's existing, what needs to be there, and it will figure out what to do, uh, which is how it should be. Uh, so, so moving towards that more declarative type of functionality. Which is always good, honestly. Speaking of declarative, we, I mean, Ansible is very declarative. I'm trying to think what else. Uh, is it pretty explicit? I call, I say explicit like that. Um, but basically what you're going to see is you're going to get that, what is it, atomic? If you run it on one machine, you're going to get it on the same one. And I think when we talk about, you know, things being atomic, you want something like a, a, you want a process to be atomic, right? Kind of like obviously run deck. Um, I know we are getting ready to wrap up run deck here. I know you have put together, I think the CLI, the command line interface, and then just a short fact if we want to jump into that. Absolutely, yeah. So the the episode today is going to round out our discussions of Rundeck, uh, hence, hence the, the title. title. I like that. <laughs> and uh, there's the the, the the title was actually given to Jack by me because I couldn't decide on a on a better one, and and. I, I was I was stuck here, split between you know what 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 do I talk about? Do I talk about the CLI? Um, do I do I talk about the general use case of of Rundeck? And and I think the answer to both those questions were yes, because they both should be discussed. Um, and unfortunately, I don't think both of them are meaty enough to have their own integration discussion. So I'm just going to go ahead and lump these two together. Uh, and then we're going to move on to the next service after that, which is TBD. So the the CLI, uh, if we want to touch on that really quick, uh, is a discussion about the, the CLI tooling uh, that Rundeck provides. So uh, Rundeck has a CLI command RD, um, which is actually a Java client to access and interact with a Rundeck instance from the command line. In a few words, Rundeck CLI is a Rundeck API abstraction tool 
With RunXCLI, it is possible to view system information, list executions, list of managed jobs, manage keys, list of managed node sources, projects, and jobs in the command line. So it, it does a lot. It, it, it does most of everything that you need it to. Uh, so just to go over the the basics here, and, and I guess I'll back up a second. So the the way in which we use the Rundex CLI is, I think, solely to create tokens. Uh, and and we, those are those are the API tokens that we pass on to the instances uh, because that is done via Ansible. Uh, while it's acting on the local connection to the to the local machine, which in this case happens to be a container, so we are able to to generate that programmatically and then store it um, in the the repo that we need, so that the instances can use that API key and that API key gets updated uh, every so often. Uh, in fact, all of the existing instances will have theirs updated tomorrow if all goes well, but the the, the CLI uh, has a couple different quirks. So the, the, the first quirk is that it doesn't come pre-installed in the container. Um, so, th and, and even installing Rundeck will not install it, right? It has a repo that you can put in for your system's uh, package manager. Uh, so they have setup instructions for uh, Red Hat type distributions, um, Debian based distributions and the container itself, I believe is built on 1804, uh, Ubuntu, if not 2004, uh, either way that would be a Debian based distribution. So it has the instructions to do that. Um, we have a, what amounts to a post execute script in our setup of run deck, uh, that will, run whatever bash script we, we tell it to. And in there, uh, we basically curl down uh, the script to add it to the repo, run the script, uh, and the script adds all the necessary things to the repo so that we can do a simple apt install uh, of the, the run that client um, inside of the container. Then once that is installed, uh, it needs configuration, of course, because you know, it's not a central Rundex server, it's our own Rundex server. Sure. And there are three points that are strictly necessary, at least for our usage of this, which is uh, passing the URL, the user, and the password. Um, and that's detailed out into which environment variables uh, need to be present there. You can also put these into an rd.conf file, but then you have to tell the command line tool where to find that rd.conf file by setting an rdconf environment variable. So it's like for, for some reason, if you don't want to set up the URL user and password as environment variables, you can set up this other environment variable pointing to a file with nice. those things in it. So I, more choice, I guess. Uh, if if you need that uh, flexibility, but uh, you're not really going to get... Actually, you, you know what? There is probably a flag. I haven't looked this up, but there's probably a flag that you could pass uh, to the RD command line tool to specify where that file is in case you really, really don't want to specify environment in variables. environment variable for it. <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's, that's a bit much for me. I, th I think... <laughs> I think it's fine uh, to set environment <laughs> variables. It's not taboo for anyone. Um, uh, and, and you can also use an API token if you want to. I forgot to mention that. So that's that's also available. Having uh, discussed that previously, those are, those are available uh, to use on the command line. Uh, and then lastly here, I list the available commands. Um, and, and it's really just what I had, had gone through before. Uh, there is documentation, uh, both on the rundeck.com website and for rundeck.github.io. So their GitHub pages um, are built for the Rundeck CLI repo. Um, I, I think they may be programmatic. I honestly didn't dig into it, but it it is, you know, structured in such a way that leads me to believe that this is something that gets generated regularly from 
from inbuilt information, which is which is how it should be. In, in fact, you know, I found a tool uh, that not Ansible put out, some someone else put out, but you could you could uh, have a markup for your comments in Ansible uh, that would then generate documentation based on the comments inside your Ansible playbooks, right? And and that is that is really the best way I think to do, you know, documentation, right? Which is to oh, yeah. have self-documenting code. So every time I see that, I, I kind of geek out. Um, but the 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 Rundex CLI tool has all of these these things in the the documentation um, for you for us. So the next part of this, I know previously I had done a question and response episode uh, and, and sent out, you know, a, a call for questions. I just didn't think about that till too late for this. So I put together, you know, three kind of innocuous um, softball questions that we could sure. we could answer uh, on the air here. Uh, so, so, Jack, why don't, why don't you walk us through those and, and uh, feel free to add any spin you think might make it interesting. Well, what's that here on the uh, FAC for uh, run back here? Um, I'll read off the questions here. Uh, the first one here we have is, why do you call this an automation front end? If you want to answer that one. And I was re-listening to, I think it was episode four, uh, where we yeah. kind of introduced Rundeck as a service and and uh, touched on automation front end a little bit. Uh, and, and in going back to that, I, I picked out four points here. So the, the first one is it's not an orchestration tool. Uh, the, the orchestration tools that I've used have a lot of meta programmability wherein they can, during what they are running, you know, what they are running actually changes the run itself in the future. So it's it like, you know, it th there's a lot more than simple branching of, okay. of workflows. It's actually like uh, injecting stuff into the workflow that you will be running later or skipping something in advance or, or so doing other things like that. So I guess if it's not an orchestration tool, for my sake here, can you explain, can you give me an example of one orchestration tool? Is that something like Terraform? Or is that, what do you, what do you have, what do you have in mind? What comes to mind? It's going to be something, something like that? that, that is a, a, a bit more beefy. And, uh, I, I, gotcha. I, I see a lot of this in, in the enterprise space. So sure. you, you think, uh, service now. Right, where it is okay. also a okay. CMDB I've and gotcha. it is also an ITSM tool. So you're managing stuff from within change tickets about, you know, uh, items in your configuration management database. Uh, and then you're pulling all of those together and it's making decisions on the fly as to how to deal with the input that it, it receives. Um, so then that can call out then to an automation front end. Um, to to run individual scripts, right, and and, and to run one thing at a time, rather than walk through an entire event of of different scripts. Now, that's not to say that it's impossible to do that with Rundex. It's just that Rundex functionality is limited in that regard. It it keeps itself to simple. Uh, simple conditional, simple workflow steps, right? You can do things like include jobs with other steps and have conditional steps. And so there, there is, there's a way to do it, but it's not as beefy as some of the other things that I've touched, nor do I think sh it should be. Okay. Um, enough, yeah. and, and, yeah. and that's one of the other things too, because it's the automation front end is meant to replace butts and seats, right? It's meant to say, if you're working through a change ticket and you get to a task and say, have this team run this script, right? I hate to see that because that should be automated, right? And that's right. the orchestration's job to say, how do I call that thing, right? And with Rundeck, you have a real simple answer. You call it through Rundeck. Like, I mean, that's right. That's the answer to that question right. in all, all scenarios. So Rundex should be the thing that replaces that butt in the seat. And then it should also allow someone to go in and run it, you know, 
as as you would, you know, in in your seat. You know, they they should allow that kind of interaction so that you can get that hands-on experience to test it, to go through it, you know, while you while you ensure that this is something that does work correctly in fact the majority of the time and then transition it over into an orchestration tool. Um, the third reason I have as to why I called this an automation front end is because command and control server was already taken. Uh, the sure. interesting thing about Rundeck is that we don't simply use it to, to push out reactionary changes, right? Um, the instances themselves can proactively contact Rundeck to have it do something on their behalf, right? So this isn't this isn't a, 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 a dummy kind of instance that we have running out there. It isn't simply something on SSH into to run scripts. It's something that has a service that can accept input and and commands from from other location. Uh, so there, there's a bit more nuanced approach to a, a simple run the script type of, of interface. It, it needs to be secure enough to be accessible uh, to, to receive those requests from other machines, right? So it, it's, it's not simply a, you know, uh, what are some of the things that you and I came up with, Jack? I mean, we had... We had a couple different options like a configuration server or central management. Yeah, right? one was specific to SQL, I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And and what we really wanted to communicate was this: this is a, a a front end, right? Both in a sense that it can be used by humans and contacted via the API, right? By by machines, right? For our automation, um, which would be the underlying stuff that we programmed it to do. So that's a that's a long explanation to what probably is a simple question. Answer us why we call it a front end because there's a front there's a web UI around it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. All right. And that's fine. I mean that I think all those answers honestly mm -hmm. are kind of needed because you're right. It's not a full on. It, it's not an enterprise automation tool right it's not right a service now or something enterprisey but it does give you enough power to do what you need to do and con control the machines uh the next one here the next question i have for you is don't you don't we doesn't our compose just use a small subset of rundex functionality yes we do <laughs> <laughs> so uh talk about softball questions here y yeah i mean we're we're not using a lot of what Rundeck has. Uh, for instance, I mean, I've already talked about it. You know, you're able to call jobs from within other jobs, right? That that alone, right, is one of the things that I look for in any kind of tooling that I'm using because that means that I can make stuff modular. That is very, very important, right? Uh, this this whole manual execution, automation, orchestration, three tier hierarchy thing also exists when you're running scripts you look at you know how we run ansible we have we have meta playbooks include specific playbooks which include the necessary roles or the you know so so you you want to have this modularity as, as as far as you can you know and and jeff was even talking about it you know making stuff just yeah make it able to make it be able to plug in make it make it something easy that developer can walk up and say hey look i, I want to do this with this and then you just say okay great our tool has these features available for you to basically plug and play with your plugin or with your application, whatever you want to kind of si side load, I'll say. Yeah, and and that is also something I create for future Andrew because I don't know what he's going to come up with, what problems he's going to face. So the more I'm able to make things in a modular type fashion, the more I'm able to to give myself the freedom to do cool things down the road. Right. So, so that's that's one of the things that, that we just don't use from within Rundeck because we've already got it down with Ansible. Like we we don't right. need we right. don't need this functionality out of Rundeck because a lot of what we do is in Ansible. Uh, speaking of that, you know, we don't need to put all the nodes that we manage into Rundeck. We don't need the all the instances to be uh, connecting. Managed. Yeah, yeah to, right. To, to, to be you know able to connect via Rundeck to be managed via Rundeck you know we're we we just don't because we have uh, inventory files and Ansible and we have uh, private keys that we we keep 
you know, secured, secured within run deck, right? Uh, but not necessarily something that we need to, to manage the instances with. Ansible does a perfectly fine job itself going out and doing the needful, right? Uh, so, you know, there may come a point in time but we need to, but, but once again, this small subset that we're using run deck for, you know, is, is for mainly for the, is mainly for the GUI on top of this and for the API. Oh, for sure. The, well, I'm going to add in one more thing. I think the authentication and authorization Absolutely. is very well done. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mean, obviously API, we definitely use and take advantage of, but really the ACLs are I would argue at an enterprise level uh, for something. And so they're really nice to have, uh, honestly, just when I look at them. It really is. So, and that, and I only say that because it leads right into our next question. What are the alternatives, right? And you can kind of cover them, but I know I'm just going to say it right here. Jenkins is one of them. And I'm sure Jenkins has a plugin, a, a, a great plugin for authentication and ACLs, but out of the box, you just can't beat what Rundeck has to offer. Yeah, and, and that was a lot of what I was seeing as well when I was doing this research way back in the day is to, you know, what what can we use for that automation front end? It's just, you know, um, and, and I believe I had set up actually a Jenkins instance to, to, to demo it out. it out. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and it is actually quite powerful, right? Um, however, sure. at its heart, it's a true automated, leave it alone CICD, you know, yep. uh, application builder and and while you know you can bastardize it into an automation front end why do that when you have something like rundeck right when you have something whose whose sole purpose is to be able to to provide that that front end for the for running the scripts now the question inevitably comes up why not awx right the the open source version of sure. advanceable's tower um, and and even I mean tower is free for the first ten instances. Now, obviously, we no longer would be able to qualify for that. But well, we would honestly because we only do one instance. Uh, I think it's for node. Instance. I think it's for managed node. Right, and we only do one. We only have one managed node for run deck because nothing connects back. But we run, if we, oh, I guess we, we run, run Ansible. Yeah, with, we, we run, run Ansible, Ansible with it. Okay, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Ansible yeah, yeah. is smart enough to be like, "Hey, you're connecting to a new node. You can't do that." Exactly. Right. Okay, I've got gotcha, you. I've got gotcha. you. I was thinking, yeah, just run AWX. Ansible on localhost, and then yeah, yeah, no, it's it not. But no, yeah, I wish. Okay. That. Well, and okay. and even at that point, I mean, we're not taking advantage of of any of its features, and it's it's really right. not going to like that. Like for instance, um, there is a plugin that Rundeck has for Ansible, right? Um. It doesn't manage uh, the environment that we have it set up with, right? It doesn't mat. Uh, it, 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 it. I'm not even sure if it can install roles dynamically or you know collections dynamically, right? And we install a brand new collection for every single run, right? And sure, there is something to be said about doing it the tools way, right? Not trying sure. to to get all fancy, but. I think what we have works for us in the sense that it, pro it allows us the flexibility to use it for development purposes, which also gets us used to that tool as that source of where we're, we're running the stuff from so that we speak the same language, right? Um, AWX, uh, no doubt, is going to have those limitations in place as well, right? right? It's it's going to expect something. It's going to be opinionated. Um, and it's also going to want to, and and I've learned this from, from my day job, you know, it's going to want to run in containers. It's going to want to have execution environments. It's going to want all these things that assume that you're in a, a typical large data center environment where you have a management network that you stand up a server or a cluster on and yeah. then you do the things there and 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 that's simply not what we're dealing with we're dealing with a container inside of a server uh, that's that's running our our automation front end right whereas AWX would want a lot more control over that um, 
not saying that there's not pros uh, to to each of those. You know, Jenkins being able to do a lot more of that meta programming that I was talking about, that orchestration, um, and and AWX really being the gold standard for for Ansible. Uh, but I think for where we are and what we're doing, Rundeck is the perfect fit. It allows me to do just what I need in the way I need to do it. Yeah, absolutely. It fits our need perfectly, honestly. So, I don't know. With that, I, I'm kind of trailing off you here from the last episode. I'm going to tell you that right now. On uh, what I'm trying to think what you did last episode. I know you, you covered uh, basically it was the end of the year. Right at the end of the year, for those that don't know. Now, we're at the very beginning of the year, which leads to me going to the gym and running on the treadmill and with all the other resolutioners. So I decided, all right, fine. I'll set my uh, grab bag for this week to be goals, what they look like, setting them, following through with them, why people go basically two weeks to the gym and then quit. <laughs> because there's quite a bit of that, let's all be honest. Um, and I think just to first get started, you have to ask yourself, what is goal setting? Honestly, some people have trouble sticking to goals because they don't distinguish their goals from more casual, everyday self-improvement efforts. And I think that's a big thing to note because you look down the road, you say, where do I want to be in 10 years? Where do I want to be in five? Where do I want to be in two? Where do I want to be in one? What am I going to be doing in the next quarter, you know, half year out? Um, what am I going to do today? And what I kind of distinguished with goal setting is you have to have the one year uh, or basically the yearly but you have to have the 10 year i think the vision is what the t i describe as the 10 year you, you can have a morphing 10 year goal but if you make it too lofty sometimes you get into the all right this is never gonna you know wow did i way underestimate myself i'm here in a year or oh my gosh i'm never gonna be able to i'm, I'm not walking on the moon i don't even know how space works uh so basically with goal setting uh just because <laughs> getting back into what I have here, uh, not to tangent off too much, uh, just because you decide to start running every day doesn't necessarily make it a conscious goal. Uh, so basically I want to get back into what goal setting means. And I, this, this one was copied. This first sentence here, this first show note was copied. And I kind of took it personally because I was honestly just running with no purpose in mind. I would go out, I'd run like two miles, three miles and just call it. I'd be like, Oh, that's great. And I always said, oh, okay, I'm going to run a marathon. You know, no date in mind, no nothing in mind, no heavy training days. It was like every day it would be like, all right, I'm going to go out and walk. I'm going to go out or, you know, I'm going to go out three days a week and I'm going to run. And I'd set a like time, just be like, all right, I want to run this in. I'm no track star like you, Andrew. I'll just admit that right now. Uh, I'm going to go out and run it three miles in like 30 minutes, you know, something easy, right? Just say 10 minute mile, fine. You know, <laughs> a full year passes. I never brought the goal down. I was like, I should have been by the end of the year running you know, close to a 20 minute 3K, but there I am at the end of the year just running like a 28 minute mile. It's like, wait, hang on. That could have come way down if you were conscious about what you were doing. Instead, you just decided to go out and not pay attention to it. So I'm not going to talk about OKRs. I'm not going to talk about anything corporate. I'm talking about personal goal setting just as almost a refresher. I think everyone's familiar with this at this point. Everyone knows what SMART goals are. Everyone knows kind of where they want to set their goals, what those look like. But So you have you have the second paragraph here. What do you what do you mean by that? Uh it's purposeful. So you have to go you have to have kind of a purpose for it. Uh it's explicit. Obviously, for, there's an explicit for goal setting. Yeah, goal setting. Yeah. Goal okay. setting is a purposeful and explicit process that starts with identifying new objectives, a new objective skill or project you want to achieve. Then you plan for achieving it and you work to complete it. Basically, you can't just aimlessly meander with daily tasks and then expect at the end of the year that they piled up into something important mm. because usually that's unfortunately not how it works. You have mm. to have some kind of goal, right? So. I really liked uh, purposeful um, actions have to have purpose, right? There's no, you're not, there's no sense in doing something without a purpose, uh, which kind of brings us back to, I think like the first or second episode, it always, somehow it always keeps coming up the autonomy, ma mastery and purpose discussion. Mm -hmm. You know, why am I doing this? 
what's the purpose of it? Am I making the decision on it? Um, yeah, the three keys of motivation. Yeah. It's like what? Yeah. What what motivates me to do something? Well, you know, having autonomy over doing it, becoming having mastery at it. You know, getting getting mastery of it's it the, and, and, it, and purpose yeah. the purpose it, of it. And really, with goal setting, it boils down to the two at the end. It's achieving it and completing it, which are basically the same thing. We're working towards completing it. But with that being said, um, smart goals. I it's something I always try to refer to because usually I'll set some goal. Uh, I, I set most of my goals in a, in a cam board, and I set the dates for, like, 1231, honestly. So I woke up, uh, I kind of set them in the first week, and I set them for 1231. I don't set them in a calendar. Don't ask me why. It's because if it, you know, if something happens on the board and I need to move it, I can't, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I can say, look, I planned for, to do this this year, but guess what? It's not happening. I'm not going to do it this I year. I mean, but. specifically – to that i mean this year i was hoping to get like a what did i shoot for i th- i wanted to shoot for somewhere around a 21 22 minute 5k like i yeah. i thought that was pretty achievable um at the at the very end of the summer like early on into the fall i hit about a a seven minute mile which is right on target awesome. yeah right, right yeah. on target uh right after that Uh, tore my hamstring and busted my foot same same day yeah right and i'm limping home like this sucks (laughs) right you know totally because like there goes there goes that um and and you know having made progress towards it right it, it it feels frustrating having set that up and 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 push that especially if i were to have that in a calendar forget about it and then the end of the year comes up and 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 now i just feel that pain again (laughs) more pain (laughs) yeah so and well i'm not gonna wrap it up just yet but honestly next thing is i'll I'll make these two sections brief you know you everyone knows what smart goals are right you know i would i would love to hear it again specific your goal has to be specific right you can't just go out and say i'm gonna do something better it has to be explicit like i forget the good examples it's like uh not smoking every day was an ex- a good example because that's explicit right you can sit down and say did you smoke a cigarette you know did you smoke a pack of cigarettes today or did you not and it's like no i did not okay great explicitly you are one for one on your talk you know <laughs> you did it <laughs> and maybe that ropes more into measurable too right you can measure that. Yeah. Uh, the next one is attainable, um, which well, measurable, being the, measurable one, being, yeah, yeah. measurable being the second one. Actually, yeah, measurable being the second one, and I think that's kind of where I roped in. I think I roped in. Uh, mm-hmm. So as specific as I'm going to smoke one pack or zero pack cigarette a day. Fine. Measurable would be okay. <laughs> it's not. I'm your goal can't be. I'm going to smoke less because you can't measure that. Yes. So, Exactly. That's where the goal is. Exactly. Uh, attainable, obviously. It, terrible. I, I don't know why I pick smoking, but I'm not a smoker. Um, <laughs> attainable. <laughs> so it's like, okay, are you just going to cut cold and do this? Yeah. Um, or it's like, is my goal to go to, if my goal is to go to space and I'm not an astronaut, that's is that really an attainable goal for me to say I'm going to do in a year? Exactly. Uh, Maybe in 2050 it might be, but not right now. Sure. Uh, Same with realistic. You know, it has Mm -hmm. to be realistic. And then time bound, I think, Mm -hmm. is one of the key ones. You have to kind of do it. You have to kind of choose a timeline for this. Yeah, to harp on that time bound thing again, that is, to me, the point at which you can not give up, right? But you can declare failure, you know, and, and... and as and that's a, perfect as that's a method perfect. for rebirth yeah yeah because honestly what the time bound does it says you're gonna do it within this timeline right and so if you make the goal i'm gonna do this and i'm gonna run a 21 minute mile in half a year that means you have now until june that doesn't mean well if i give myself a year and that's where i brought i want to bring back all the way to the other article work gives you work is work will take the amount of time you give it yeah so it's like you have to set the goal realistically within that time frame because if Mm -hmm. you give it until a year it's like okay well i could do this in half am i does that mean i'm just gonna sit on the goal for six months and then start 
to do it for the last six? Or does that mean I'm going to do it now and finish it by June, per se? Um, so the time bound, I think, is really the most important, honestly. And making it uh, measurable uh, would be the two for me. If you don't set goals, that's poor life management. Right. At that right? point. Right. Uh, you, you have to have something that you're you're going for. Right. In, in order to move forward, you have to have something you're you aim for. Are have going a to a goal. Right. Have a thing to address. Have a thing to make better. Right. Whether it's in your life or someone else's life, it doesn't have to all be about you. Right. It could be that you're trying to make someone else's life better, your family life's better, your spouse's life better. Right. That that could be one of your goals. And that's that's fine you know and and that goal can be specific and measurable and attainable and realistic and time bound right and that's that's fine but don't slack off and just let life happen right, right? have some kind of a goal if it, it gives life purpose to have goals right and and if if you're there if you need help you know defining your goals if you need help coming up with your goals if you you know w whether that be business or personal at this point you know it it doesn't really matter right i mean there there are plenty of people you know in the world that you can sit down and and will help you out right and right. and it's a matter of talking these things through of of understanding where you're coming from understanding what where you want to go and, and, and the goals you set. And, and yeah, there are good guiding principles like these SMART goals, making them measurable, making them time bound, right? If, if you haven't ever created a goal before, you know, you may not know that you're setting yourself up for failure if you don't do that. From the start, right. Exactly. So, so if, if that's something that you're racking your brain about, you know, give us a call. We're, we're, we're here to sit down, whether it's fitness goals, whether it's business goals, whether it's, you know, whatever. I'm more than happy to, to, to reach out a helping hand to do this. Whether, you know, whether we're looking at, you know, stuff at, at, at our Compose, you know, I, I love yeah. my board systems. You hear us talking about these all day. I don't I'm care converted, use... honestly. Yeah, I'm converted to the board system. I said you got to write the goal down. Where did I write it down? I didn't write it on my calendar. Wrote it on my board. But there yeah, you go. go ahead. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, and and you know, I, I think this is a tool that helps people. If if you have a tool that that helps you as well, that's that's great, right? Let's make sure that we're doing these things. We're making life worth living, right? And and. I'm more than happy, even if it doesn't, you know, it's not something about our Compose. I, I'd much rather it be because I, I think these tools help, right? But I'd be more than happy to sit down and, and, and go over go over anything like that with you. So reach out. I mean, the contact, contact uh, form is on our website, ourcompose.com, right? Sign up for the, the, the mailing list if you want or, or just reach out. I mean, we love this stuff. We live and breathe this stuff, right? And and we will continue to be here doing this. And with that, we hope you enjoyed this final run deck episode. Thank you. Be safe. And we'll see you all in two weeks. Bye, everybody.